Merry Christmas. Oh, well, let, let's try that in Spanish. Feliz Navidad. It sounded stronger in Spanish. I wonder what's going on. Well, this morning and for the next four weeks, I want us to ponder. I want us to really think about it. I want us to ponder the question, is it possible, listen to me now, is it possible to miss Christmas? Well, all right. Thank you for being so excited. But put on your spiritual seatbelt for a second, okay? Because I know that we've known each other, one another, for years now. So I venture to say that I know what some of you are thinking. Mm -hmm. How could I possibly miss it, Pastor Garcia, when everything around me reminds me of Christmas, when everything around me screams out, Christmas, 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 the music on the radio, the commercials on TV, the lights, the decorations, the smell. Oh, yeah, everything screams out Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. And some of you are thinking, Pastor Garcia, if I'm honest with you, even my credit card reminds me is Christmas. The church reminds me, look around you guys, the church reminds me it's Christmas. For crying out loud, Pastor Garcia, I saw you out there with the three amigos, Tom Wrench, Jim Royer, and Juan Morales. You put up two big banners out there that reminds us Christmas at the door. How could I possibly? Well, before you get too excited, let me remind you that I'm here to tell you that if some people in the Bible, when the birth of Jesus took place, missed the very first Christmas, it is therefore possible that we too can miss Christmas. Yes, it is possible that in the midst of the, check it out, celebrating, in the midst of the decorating, and how could I forget, it, in the midst of eating, Singing, and yet at the same time, we could miss the reason for the season and miss out on Christmas. This morning, I want us to look at the very first person in the Bible who missed Christmas in the Bible. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be on the second chapter of Luke. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. And notice the simplicity, notice the singularity, and notice the majesty of the account that we are about to read. And he says this for the glory of God and the edification of the people of God in the name of the Son of God. And he came to pass in those days, that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing, governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So he was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And listen to verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Please close your eyes. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to repeat a short part of this prayer, but I just want to say, Father, thank you so much for we can sing your praises. Father, we thank you that the Bible says you inhabit the praises of your people. And I was thinking about Jacob when he had that dream and saw angels ascending and descending. And then he got up and said, truly God was in this place and I wasn't aware of it. Lord, if someone is not aware of your person, of your power, of your presence in this place, I ask you by your Holy Spirit and by the power of your word, you make them aware that you are here. Emmanuel is God with us in our place. Now, church, repeat after me. 
Father, speak to me. I will listen and I will obey. In Jesus' name, amen. I cannot help, when I read this text, I cannot help but think of the simplicity, of the singularity and the majesty of what we just read. But not only that, I see the singularity, the simplicity, and the majesty, but I see the hand of God all over the place, don't you? In fact, I like to put it in the words of the old Dr. J. Vernon McGee through the Bible. The hand of God in the glove of human events. God is moving things. God is positioning things. God is orchestrating, getting everybody ready. My son left the glories of heaven. Get ready. Jesus is about to be born. So I see the hand of God in the glove of human events. But that's not the only thing I see. We say, Pastor Garcia, you see a lot, but let me share them with you. I see that God has a great sense of humor. If you don't know that, talk to me later. I'll make sure you agree with me after that. But look at what's going on here. Let me see if I could break this down for you. Here is the great Caesar Augustus thinking, I am the king of the world. Everyone has to do what I say because I'm the boss. I said everybody needs to be registered, a census needs to take place, and they have to go to their own place, to the place of the lineage of their families. So look at the world is doing what I want, when I want, and how I want. Now think about it with me. If I were an angel in heaven, which I'm not, I'm barely an angel with no wings, no halo down here on earth. But if I were up there, and the Archangel Michael was in charge of me, right? Please use a little bit of sanctified imagination now. Come with me now, right? And I'm, out, I'm up there seeing Caesar Augustus saying he's the king, and everybody needs to obey me. Everybody has to do how I say, when I say, where I send them. I want to say, Michael, Archangel Michael, let me say something to Caesar. And I'll bug the archangel so much, I said, go ahead, just say a few words. And I'll just scream out to Caesar, hey, you Caesar, you're just a little pawn in God's chess game of life and eternity, and God is just using you to bring the Christ child to be born where God said he was going to be born. So little Caesar, I'm not talking about a pizzeria now, little Caesar, listen to me, God is orchestrating that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled, and you don't even know it. Someone asked someone in the church, can you tell me the two biggest problems in the church? Apparently, the person that was asked was, asked was not a believer. And the person says, I don't know and I don't care. And the Christian said, you're right. Ignorance and apathy. You don't know and you don't care. And Caesar could care less, but he didn't know. He thought he was the greatest, and he didn't know that God used this so-called emperor to bring the Christ child to where Micah had prophesied that the child was going to be born. The first thing I want you to see this morning is that the innkeeper was the very first. He was the very first. And you look at me and say, the first what? He was the first person who missed Christmas. Now, I need to be honest the Bible doesn't say a lot about him. In fact, it doesn't say anything about the innkeeper. We don't know his name. We don't know his age. We don't know if he was a friend, a businessman, or a relative. Now, I know some pastors and some scholars think that possibly because they had to go back to their family, he might have been a family member. And how many of you know that during Christmas, we realize that we have some family members that we need to pray for them a little bit more. Sometimes we call them EGR, extra grace required. But I don't know that. But I can identify with that because when I go back to my island, I don't own it, but I, I call it mine, Puerto Rico. My relatives have already passed. My mom and dad died, my grandmother, my grandfather died, my great uncles and great aunts died. So before, when they were alive, they kept the family together, if you know what I'm talking about. But now I go back and I call my first cousin, my second cousin, I said, I just came from Flint, Michigan. Big deal. 
I want to visit you. They don't text me back. They don't reply me. I show up in person, leave a note at the door, at the house. They don't call me back. My high school friends from Puerto Rico greet me. My family, please pray for my family. I want to go back. But I don't know if it was family or not. The word that is used might imply that. I don't know much about the innkeeper because the Bible doesn't say anything about him. But this we know. He was not interested. He's not even included. But even though he's not included, I think that we need to look at this passage, at the scene that is taking place. Think about the distinction that he gets for forever. He gets the distinction to be the first person who missed the birth of Christ. Think about it. Mary and Joseph knock on the door. Now, this, the Bible doesn't say we imply this because it says there was no room in the inn. So evidently, they went to an inn to see if they could get lodge or hospitality, and they were rejected. But imagine Mary and Joseph, Mary getting ready to deliver, to give birth, and he says, no room for you. Go somewhere else. So he gets a distinction of being the first who missed it. I want you to know this. Once you're the first... You're the first. You can't change that. You're stuck. I cannot help you. Because if you were the youngest, say you became the youngest heavyweight champion of the world at the age of 19. And for years you were the youngest. And there comes another person and becomes the heavyweight champion at the age of 18. You're no longer the youngest. Now someone else is the youngest. But when you're the first, you're stuck. So if you have to be the first, be the first one to love. So if you have to be first, be the first one to show mercy, to have faith, to the first one to forgive, to show kindness. But don't miss what God is doing. Don't be the first person who misses out on what God is doing. I had a conversation on the way to church with Jose Ramos. He was sharing some things, and I kind of changed what he said. And I realized that Christ is the reason why we miss everything else. It should not be that we miss Christ because of everything else. You want me to say that again in Spanish? Christ is the reason that we miss everything else. We don't miss Christ because of everything else. He is the one that takes priority, preeminence in our lives. And that's why we worship Him and we adore Him when we say, Your Lord, O Lord, Lord of lords and King of kings. Now, there are some people that inevitably always want to be first. True story. A couple of Saturdays ago, the Saturday after Black Friday, I took my wife shopping to Birch Run Outlets. And I didn't realize that there were going to be so many people there. I mean, just trying to get in, they almost got into two car accidents because everybody's in a rush. like <laughs> Right? But we made it. And, I, I, and I'm looking for a good parking spot because, you know, Adeline has surgery, and she's, she hasn't recovered 100%, so she has to walk a little bit. I said, no, I'm going to take you. I'm trying to get my brownie points here. Follow me. I'm going to take you to the door of the store and open the door, and you go out, and then I'll go get that parking spot, right? But we didn't see anything. The only parking spaces that were available are the parking spaces you use when you buy a brand new car. You know what I mean? When it's brand new, you don't want anybody to open the door and hit your door. So you park way over there, and your car is, is like an island. So those were the only parking spaces. But this is what happened. I got my brownie points for being a loving, caring, compassionate, sympathetic pastor, husband. I opened the door, and then he goes in, and as I turn, I just, I got tiny Chinese eyes, but I could see really well. I seen that it was almost as if the Red Sea opened for me. And a parking spot very near to where my wife was going to be opened up for me. So I just thought, well, God is rewarding me for being a loving, caring husband, right? So when you see that God is rewarding you, how do you do it? You do it with style. 
I mean, I wish I had my sunglasses, Brent. I would just put on, because when, when you drive, you drive with one hand over here and the other like that. Now, watch me, watch me do this. You know, I mean, I'm enjoying this. I wanted, I wanted to turn on the, the radio, but it was set on the Christian station, so I know it wasn't going to happen. And I was hoping that the, the song would come out, this is how you do it, as I'm parking, you know? I didn't turn on the Christian station. But as I'm getting ready to receive my reward, someone with a big SUV, the license plate should have read Fast and Furious, just when she had no signal. I mean, when you do it right, you put the signal. This person had no signal. She probably thought this guy is taking too long and it's going slow. And she just went run running there and took my parking space. I tell you, all that loving, all that caring, all that, it went right out the window. <laughs> I wanted to get out of the car and say a few words in Spanish. <laughs> but then a thought came to mind. What if somebody's watching and videotaping Pastor Garcia and they put it on YouTube or something? Here's one of the pastors of Mayfair, how he treats people, right? It, a thought came to mind, right, that, that I needed to control myself. I said, Lord, I'm going to let you fix this because if I fix this, I might be in Genesee County Jail. <laughs> so with style, I looked at the person, I said, and I went, I got my brand new parking spot way over there. My wife didn't know about this, but I think it was years ago I heard Chuck Swindoll tell a story similar to this one. I'm not sure if it was a true story or not, but I heard Chuck Swindoll tell a story. It was an old lady. She went shopping in one of those crazy shopping days, and she went around the parking lot several times waiting for that parking spot to open and wait, and finally it opened up, and she's get ready to get in there. A sporty car jumps right in and takes her spot, and the young man comes out of the car and looks at her, huh, I'm young and fast. And as he's walking away, he hears, Ba-boom, ba-boom. She is smashing her car on the sporty car. So the young guy comes back and says, lady, are you crazy? What's wrong with you, lady? She says, I'm old and rich. <laughs> now the moral of the story, let others be first. It is nice. Isn't it nice when a gentleman says to a lady, ladies first? I mean, nowadays, I've done that to some people. They look at me like I'm weird, like if I was born in a different planet or something. But it's nice. Or you, say, or you open the door and you say to someone, after you, sir. Right? You show kindness. But I, I, I'm thinking about this, and I thought about it, and I said an idea came to mind that there's got to be at least one exception to the rule. And the rule is this. If there is flung... Don't let everybody go first because you're going to end up with no flung at the end. Now, I know this church would understand that because this happened to me. And I'm here to tell you, what did the innkeeper miss? Why are you making a big deal about the fact that he was the first? Well, he missed the singularity of the event. This was the only time in human history never to be repeated again when a virgin was going to give birth to the Son of God. You think about it. I I know he didn't know and he didn't care. He was ignorant and, 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 and he had apathy. I understand that. But he missed it. He missed that. The the one point in history when the virgin was going to give birth to the Son of God. He missed out on showing hospitality. He missed out on giving shelter and care to God in thy birth. And by the way, that's my definition of Christmas. In short, He missed out on the incarnation of the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Think about it. Christ was born in a manger. What a lowly place for such such a high visitor. So the innkeeper will forever be known as the very first. But the innkeeper was very, very indifferent. The innkeeper, I already told you, he didn't care. He was apathetic and indifferent. Joseph and pregnant, ready to deliver at any time, Mary didn't look wealthy. They didn't look like they had a lot of money. They didn't look like people that had a lot of means. They looked like two very simple, poor teenagers with nothing to offer. But at the very least, 
Come on, follow this story here. At the very, very least, he should have been concerned for the pregnant young maiden. Now, to be fair, and we need to be fair, the innkeeper didn't know that Mary and Joseph were chosen by God and that Mary carried in her womb the Christ child, the very one who held the universe in, in existence. All right, you following me? The innkeeper did not know that scripture that we read in Isaiah 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and, uh, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And indeed, Mary conceived in the silence of the night. And I wrote this last night thinking about, this is interesting, that the loneliness of the description found in Holy Writ is so profound that it's actually deafening. Think about the loneliness that is described in this verse. And all I'm going to say when you read here that she, no help, no midwives, gave birth to her first son, and she, no help, no midwife, wrapped the baby in swaddling clothes, which were really rags that they wrapped around the baby. She did it all by herself, all alone. So I'm going to just say this to you this morning. I hope you take it to heart. Think of the people. And please remember this season, the people who are lonely. Don't forget them. I say, oh, they have family. But there, there might be someone in our midst who lost a loved one. And there's going to be a loneliness that we cannot understand. A loneliness that we could only pray that God by His Spirit bring comfort. I want you to pray. I want you to show encouragement. I want you to show kindness. And be the first to show some emotional aspect of the love of God to that person. Because they, indeed they are lonely during that time. The innkeeper didn't know that Micah 5.2 said this. But you... Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you're little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from all, from everlasting to everlasting. He was so indifferent that he missed out not only on the singularity of the event, but on the simplicity of the event he didn't know that God delights to use simple things to confound the wise. That God, the God of heaven, left the glories of paradise to be born in the mangers, the lowest of places for the highest visitor. This is what I want you to take from this. Keep it simple. Don't complicate your life. Keep it simple. Let the wonder and the beauty and the simplicity of the birth of the birth of the Savior, fill your heart with joy and wonder so that you don't miss Christmas. But the innkeeper was indifferent, and he missed it altogether, missed the singularity and the simplicity of the event. The last thing I want to show you from the innkeeper is that he was very preoccupied, wasn't he? The innkeeper was too busy to care, too busy to care for a pregnant woman ready to give birth. I do believe with all my heart that millions of people miss Christmas because, check it out, tis the season to be busy, 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 busy. Right? Look at your calendar. You're a busy bee. Preoccupy with buying meaningless, useless things that you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't like. We're just being honest, right? And how do you know they don't like it? Because if they liked you, you wouldn't have to buy things you don't need with money. You don't have to impress them. They'll like you anyway. Things or nothing is all about Jesus. It's not about you buying things. Listen, if you have time for a thousand things and not time to worship Jesus, you're missing Christmas. You are. Christmas is the reason we miss everything else. Not everything else, the reason we miss Christmas. The innkeeper missed the majesty of it all. We've seen the singularity. This, this, this is not going to happen again. No more virgins are given birth. This is the one time when the Son of God became flesh, the incarnation took place. It's a singular event not to happen ever again. He missed the simplicity of God sending his son to be born in a stable, in a manger. Some people say it was a cave. We don't really know, but you could argue about that later. I'm not here to argue. He missed that, but let me tell you what he missed 
that really hurts me that he missed it. He missed the majesty of what was taking place because he was too busy. Look at your own life. Do you spend more time shopping than you do worshiping and praising Christ? Don't answer out loud. We don't want to know. Did you spend more money on stuff that you've invested than what you invested in the kingdom of God? If you did, maybe you're in the same trap, in the same snare that the innkeeper was, missing out on the beauty and the majesty and the wonder of Christmas. And now I'm going to share with you a true story, a veridic illustration, but I'm going to give you a caveat. So here's a caveat. Don't do it. I get away with it because I'm ugly and my wife dresses me funny. That's a caveat. But this is a true story. It happened in 1996 or 1997. I don't remember. Almost, almost 30 years ago. Edelin and I went shopping. And when I say we went shopping, she really went shopping. I just went to accompany her. Because as you know, I don't have the gift of shopping. So we just went Christmas shopping at the store in Connecticut, which shall remain nameless. Suffice to say that it is an an American multinational retail corporation founded by someone whose last name is Walton. <laughs> Let your imagination go wild. So we were checking out. we done our thing. We're checking out. And the young cashier rang our last item and asked, Is that going to do it? I looked at what the cash register said. And back in 1996, I said, Yeah, that did it. That broke me. That did it. Again, you know, we're, we're getting ready to take our stuff and, and move away. And, 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 and as we get ready to go, she looked at me and said, Happy holidays. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay. Holy days, happy holidays. But like I said, I'm, I'm ugly and my wife dresses me funny. So in that moment, the preacher in me came out. In that moment, I kid you not, I looked at her and I, I asked her a question. I wasn't being mean or offensive. I just said, which holiday are you talking about? I tell you, she was not expecting that. She's like, huh? She probably used to people reply happy holidays back, right? Because that's what you do. So I just simply say, please tell me, it's on you now. Which holiday are you wishing me happiness on? You know? And, and, and you, should, you should see her. She had no answer. She was paralyzed. So I said, do you mean the holy month of Ramadan? She didn't know what that was. Do you mean Hanukkah, this festival of lights? Which holiday? And by this time, we had a little audience. I'm sure the people over there are looking at me and say, why doesn't this Puerto Rican just shut up and pays for the stuff he bought so I could pay for the stuff that I don't need with money I don't have to impress people I don't like. Something like that. I mean, but there's a little audience. Nobody, the, the conversation's going on. It's like, nobody's ever asked her this question. She's trying to wonder. So I'm saying, which holiday are you talking about? And I could see it in her face. So I took the initiative and I said, so you mean to tell me that you've taken the one singular event in human history that divided time in two? This is the preacher in me coming out. Before Christ and after Christ, you've taken the one event in history when God became a baby. You've taken the one time in history when a virgin gave birth to the Son of God and you turned it into a mere holiday. There was dead silence. Even the people who were watching were silenced. So I looked at her and I said, I think not, young lady. And as I'm walking out with my wife, I hear a little tiny voice say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> now, it's okay to say happy holidays. I'm not against that. But if your purpose of saying happy holidays is to exclude Christmas, I think you're missing out the majesty. Because there is nothing like Christmas. There's nothing like the Word who was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him, and without Him, nothing was created. He was with God, and he was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's something to be celebrated. That's something to be proclaimed. That's something to be announced. Hey, friend, brother, sister, turn on the light. I hear people, and it is true, that the simplicity of the birth of Christ has been drowned by paganism and by commercialism and all the isms. And I understand that, but you mean to tell me you're going to let them 
Turn off the light on the joy of the world? You mean to tell me that you're going to let commercialism turn off the light? You mean to tell me that you're going to let paganism turn off the light? No, no. I'm going to turn on the light, and I'm going to say, I'm going to let my little light shine. I'm going to let somebody know I celebrate the birth of the Son of God. I know he wasn't born on this season, but I celebrated on this season. I know I wasn't there, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, God, I don't know if you have a DVR, a Blu-ray DVR. I don't know what you have. I mean, if I was saying this in the 80s, I would have said, do you have a VCR? <laughs> if you have something. But I'm sure that whatever God has is a lot better than whatever you and I can imagine because it's something I do want to see. I wish he could show me. I want to see when the Savior of the world, in all his beauty and majesty, and in the simplicity of what it is to be born in the lowest of places, became a baby, and God was wrapped in, in swaddling clothes. That's why my definition of Christmas is God in diapers. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. My friend, my brother, my sister, we can miss the meaning of Christmas by wanting to be the first at the expense of others. You can miss the meaning of Christmas, and you can miss Christmas altogether by being indifferent and not caring for others. And yes, you can miss it by being too busy, 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 and you have no time for the needy, for the hurting, for the lonely, so busy that you don't have any time for God and for what God is doing in the simplest way. This is what I want to tell you this morning. Don't miss the singularity of this beautiful event that we celebrate, that we call Christmas. Don't miss the simplicity of this beautiful event. And by all means, do not lose the wonder and the majesty of, of Christmas. Throughout Scripture, we see that there is no room for God. I want to ask you, is there room in your house Is there room in your life? Is there room in your heart for him? Luke 2, 7 says that there was no room for Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus to be born in the inn. But I ask you, can you hear him knocking on the door of your heart? Can you hear him asking, is there room in your heart for Jesus? Jesus, can you come into my heart and make me born again? That should be your prayer. Make me born from above. I want to remind you that the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men can become the sons of God. Jesus was born as a baby. God took human form so he could give you, so he could give his life as a ransom for sinners. That whosoever, I'm a whosoever, any other whosoever's, I'm a whosoever, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As we stand for prayer, please stand with me. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you heard this morning the simplicity, the singularity, the majesty, and the wonder of his birth, I'm here to tell you he did that, he did that for you. He was born so he could die so you could live. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. So if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You come to Jesus as we sing. I'll be down here. Maybe others will come. If you need prayer, maybe God has been telling you, you got to make sure Christ is first. You got to make sure you know what you're doing. You got to make sure you don't get so busy that you single Christ and God out of the equation. It is all about you. It's all about eating, all about food, all about parties. No, no, no. It's about Christ. Christ is indeed the reason for the season. So as we sing this morning, after we pray, you come and give your heart. When you come and just tell, Lord, I need you. I need your strength. I need to proclaim. I need to turn on the switch so that the light of Jesus will pierce the darkness of paganism. paganism. So that the light of Jesus will pierce the darkness of commercialism. It will be all about him. And I'll give him the glory the praise and the honor. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, if we got to be first, help us to be the first loving, caring, believing, and showing mercy. But help us not to miss out on what you're doing. 
Help us to proclaim the majesty of the Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Help us to proclaim His life, His death, His burial, resurrection, and ascension, and the glorious anticipation of His coming back for His church again. May this season be a reminder to us of His great love, of how He left the glories of heaven to be born in the lowest of place in a manger. He did it for us so that we could live, live, live eternally with Him in heaven. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that as you touch people's hearts, that they will be obedient in responding to the call. In Jesus' name I pray, and God's people say, Amen.